Jacksonville isn't technically part of the Panhandle, but I'd say it's close enough to count just this once. I took a jaunt over to Florida's Atlantic coast for the day to pay a visit to the Timaquan Ecological and Historic Preserve, which is one of the handful of national park sites located in the Sunshine State. Fort Caroline National Memorial is also managed in conjunction with the preserve. It was a beautiful, slightly muggy, 80-degree winter's day here in Florida, so it made for a good day to visit. The first stop was to Fort Caroline, located along the St. Johns River, east of downtown. We Floridians usually learn about the Spanish arriving in Florida, with the founding of St. Augustine in 1565 being more or less the starting point of our history as a state. But it turns out, though, that the French got here before the Spanish. Of course, the pre-Columbian native Floridians are usually left out of the history lessons. The park itself is named for the Timaquan people, who were here to greet both sets of Europeans when they arrived. A French explorer named Jean Ribot landed along the St. John's River on May 1, 1562, and claimed the land for France by placing a big stone monument on the bluffs above the river. Today there's a granite replica of Ribot's monument, located at a picturesque little corner of the park property in the approximate place where his original column was erected. A couple years later, a group of French Protestants called Huguenots arrived and built a small fort near Ribot's landing site called La Caroline. Like the more famous arrivals up at Plymouth Rock a few decades later, the Huguenots were here for religious freedom and to give the French a toehold in the New World. Well, the folks in Spain didn't like those pesky French trying to get the edge on them over all the gold and riches that all of Western Europe thought was buried all over the place here. In 1565, the King of Spain sent Admiral Pedro Menendez to drive the French out, and in the process, he fiercely attacked Fort Caroline and kind of founded St. Augustine at the same time. The Fort Caroline of today is actually not the original. Matter of fact, no one is totally sure just exactly where the original fort was built, but this replica has been built in what is agreed to be the general vicinity. Within it, you'll get the chance to use your imagination to get an idea of what the original might have looked like. In looking around the outside of the walls, you quickly get the idea that living here in those days wouldn't exactly have been a vacation. There's even a list posted of the known names of many of those original French Huguenot colonists. Next, I went over to the Theodore Roosevelt area of the park, named of course for the great conservationist and former president who championed the setting aside of public lands for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. These trails through the coastal woods and salt marshes were particularly enjoyable on this very mild and sunshiny day. This is a small piece of land surrounded by the burgeoning development and fast-paced growth of 20th and 21st century modernization. However, when you walk the quiet trails here, you get a definite sense, a definite understanding of what we Floridians mean when we use the particular expression, Old Florida, to describe the way a certain part of the Sunshine State might feel. Old Florida is what this place used to look like. Before great modernization, urbanization, construction, and tourism came to define the state as we know it today. I mean, don't get me wrong, all Floridians are for modernization in many ways, especially when it comes to great inventions like air conditioning, which, by the way, of course, was invented by a Floridian. But you can't help but love old Florida, and this preserve contains a good bit of it. Matter of fact, this land was once owned by a man named Willie Brown, who lived here for nearly 80 years. He resided in a small cabin without electricity or running water, living off the land. The foundations of the cabin are still here. He donated his land in 1969, the year before he died, so that folks could have, quote, a place in the woods to go to. He and his family are buried in a small cemetery not far from the cabin site. Around from Willie's cabin site, you make your way around to the Salt Marsh, which is a wildly beautiful area where you'll find all sorts of wading birds and, in the summertime, probably buttloads of snakes, gators, and yellow flies, but fortunately today I encountered none of those three. Even though the trail was a bit longer than I thought it would be, I'd have to say it was, it was definitely worth the effort to make it to this part of the park. This spot definitely gave me that old Florida feel that I was hoping to see when I came here. There's a small platform overlooking the marshes, and it gives you a really great view of everything around you, from old Florida to the new industrial Florida. There are tons of shells all along the muddy marshes, which have been picked clean by the various storks and egrets and whatnot. And I'd imagine there's a pretty good bit of fishing all throughout here as, all, as well. Fans, including myself of the popular cowboy shoot-em-up video game series known as Red Dead, 
I find this area strikingly similar to portions of the game map in Red Dead Redemption 2. Lord knows I logged a pile of hours of gameplay shooting virtual egrets and spoonbills for side missions. I mean, just, just look at this place. Yeah, it's muddy and snaky looking, and if you slipped and fell on these shell beds here, you'd probably cut yourself to shreds and need to get a tetanus shot, but man, it's, it's got a wild beauty to it. As I was leaving the salt marsh, I happened upon the randomly placed gravesite of a Confederate Civil War veteran buried here in 1879 all by himself. Apparently, he really wanted to have a view of the marshes. Now, to cross the St. Johns River from this part of the park, you have two options. You either backtrack west toward downtown to cross the closest bridge and make your way through all that fun, lovely traffic, or you drive a little further east over to Mayport you wait for the next ferry crossing. Either way, you're going to be out about 45 minutes or an hour, so I decided, you know, what the heck, I might as well pay the eight bucks and wait in line for 30 minutes to take a five-minute boat ride across the river. It beat having to get back on I-295 to cross over. So, you know, when in Rome. I mean, it wasn't some great travel experience that I'll always cherish, but it was something different. I mean, when do I ever have the need to take a ferry boat? You don't need a ferry to cross Holmes Creek, that's for sure. Anyway, it, it was different, and it was fun. My next destination was Fort George Island and the Kingsley Plantation. Now, speaking of old Florida, it doesn't get much more old Florida than driving through a tunnel of trees draped with Spanish moss over a one-lane road. This would be spooky as heck at night. Just down the road, you pass the historic St. George Episcopal Church, built here in 1882 in the Carpenter Gothic style. Now, I noticed that most of the trees on this part of the road were leaning toward the west, which I assume may be because winds from the Atlantic Ocean forced them to grow that way over time. It gives the drive an odd feel, like you're traveling back in time. And I mean, isn't that what visiting these places is all about? The feeling of going back in time, of imagining what it must have really been like two or three hundred years ago? As you reach the end of the tree-covered lane, you end up at the entrance to the Kingsley Plantation, originally owned by Zephaniah Kingsley and his African wife, Anna. Inside the gate, you immediately come across the remains of 25 slave cabins built of tabby, which is a concrete made of oyster shells. Every once in a while, when I visit a particular historical place, the history of the place itself hits me real good. And it sure did here as I walked among the remains of these cabins. I mean, it, it got real. This is where real people lived. They slept here. They, they cooked their meager meals here. They rested here after endless days of hard labor. They kept what small handful of personal possessions they had here. They dreamed of better lives for themselves here. I love to visit old buildings not because of the buildings themselves, but because of the people who have passed through them. I mean, who knows who they were or what their lives were like? That's what intrigues me about history, the people. And people were never as cut and dry as we think they were. History is full of nuance and is always more complicated than we think. One of the great ironies of the Kingsley Plantation 
is the fact that the owner, Zephaniah Kingsley, was married to an African woman who he'd originally bought as a slave and then freed. After their marriage, she effectively ran the plantation and managed the slave population in her husband's absence as he traveled between his other plantation properties around the state. She lived primarily in apartments above the kitchen, mostly by her own choice, because in her culture back home, noble wives lived separately from their husbands. Like I said, history is complicated. Anyway, today it's a beautiful place to visit, and I'm glad places like this are preserved for us to enjoy and learn from. My final stop of the day was up in Little Talbot State Park along the coast at a spot called Boneyard Beach, so named for the piles of dead live oak trees strewn across the sand. It made for a pretty ending to a good day. Except that the dang mosquitoes about ate me alive. <laughs>